Good evening. Welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk About Mental Health. I'm Nels Kloster. I'm an addiction psychiatrist. I'm working in Southern Vermont. And my name is Robert Stack. I'm a licensed alcohol and drug counselor, licensed mental health counselor. Good evening. Yeah. And, and uh, this month happens to be Alcohol Awareness Month, so we thought we would uh, devote this episode to a number of topics around just that, alcohol dependence. Right. And, I, and again, uh, you know, <clears throat> our hope in Let's Talk About Mental Health and Addictions was that we could be sort of, you know, part of what's going on, what people are talking about. And today, in today's Brattleboro Reformer, was an article written by M MJ Woodburn, I think her name mm -hmm. is, and she wrote about fetal alcohol syndrome. So I, I thought I would at least acknowledge that. I, it was a very uh, interesting article. It was very informative. And really, if there was any takeaway from it, I think the takeaway would be if you're planning on having a baby, if you're pregnant, or if you're nursing, don't drink. Yeah. Um, now, it's funny because just last week I was reading somebody who was saying, well, you can have two drinks a month, I think it was, or something to that effect. Um, and, but I, I, this publication, I guess, was at a SAMHSA, uh, Substance Abuse Mental Health Administration, yeah. right? Is right, that what it's Substance Abuse and Mental Health. Uh, administrations, I, 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 something like that. Something, like, something that. like that. Yeah. But there again, it was their re recommendation is that, um, and maybe you can explain a little bit more. But the idea that you know, if there's alcohol in your bloodstream, it does, it does go to the fetus, and right. it can actually affect um, the, the unborn child. Right. Yeah. And despite, I mean, there's been all. Um, you know, we talked about once before, like the, the whole crack baby scare from years ago, and uh, the idea now with, with the opiate, with the heroin epidemic, so to speak, um, all these sort of harder, you know, drugs, as people call them. But it's alcohol that is really the most dangerous drug around, uh, around the developing fetus. With cocaine, heroin, there might be some, uh, you know, impact on very subtle sort of learning disabilities that can be corrected for the nurturing environment. Uh, maybe some withdrawal when, uh, when the child is born that can be sort of treated or, or the child can be soothed, the, the, the newborn baby. But alcohol actually leads to birth defects. And uh, so that's, uh, there's no idea about what is sort of the, um, the dose or the level of alcohol that would cause any of these problems. So that's why you, I think a lot of people take this sort of you know, a little overprotective, you know, over the top, if you will, the idea that there's no safe amount of, of alcohol. And that's based on the idea that we don't know how much alcohol can cause various, uh, you know, birth defects or, or the facial abnormalities or the intellectual uh, difficulties. So the position is, well, if we don't know, let's say that, that no alcohol whatsoever could be considered safe when you're, when you're pregnant. Now, I remember years ago, they, they used to try and say the second trimester uh, was more risky or more dangerous, if you will, than the first or the last trimester. But I haven't heard anybody say that in the last 10 years or so. So I don't know yeah. if they still hold to that or well, not. Well, the, the, the first trimester particularly, uh, that's why sometimes you recommend for women who are of childbearing age or who are considering having children that they should take folate uh, or multivitamin containing folate because quite often when you initially become pregnant, uh, it's not always planned, you're not always aware that you're pregnant, and the, what's called the neural tube is developing in those first you know, weeks and, and months of pregnancy. And that is then what becomes the, the spinal cord and, and the brain. So the idea is if you have a folate deficiency, which is often associated with, with, with alcoholism, if you're drinking a lot, your diet is decreased, it is more poor quality, and this then limits the amount of folate that you can have which then leaves you at risk for these sort of spinal and brain abnormalities happening in development, which is very early on in the pregnancy. And, and then, you know, we talked about this in, uh, in previous shows. A lot of times over the years I've noticed both uh, opiate addicts and alcoholic women saying the moment they found out they were pregnant, they stopped using. Right. And, and, and one of the things that was kind of scary for some of them was that they were successful doing that with their first child but had less success with the second child. Um, and, and also, it would also, um, it, it would be more of a struggle for them, much more difficult. And uh, so I, I think when I was reading the pamphlet and the article today in the paper, it was, they were really talking about women who had a choice. 
you know, who, you know, make a decision about drinking. I mean, they may enjoy a drink, they may go out with their friends, have a drink, they may even have a drink for dinner or celebration. But I think that the real idea of what she was saying in there is, is please, it's probably not worth the risk factor. I mean, you know, whether it's one drink or two drinks or an ounce of booze or, you know, it's the equivalent of six ounces of wine or something. Uh, quite frankly, why, why run the risk? Yeah. Why, why do that? Absolutely. I mean, it appears to increase the risk of alcoholism in, in the child that's been exposed in utero to, to alcohol. Um, you know, facial differences, you know, smaller eyes, uh, you know, flatter, um, folded lip here, smaller lips, uh, which, you know, can be, you know, a, a, there's a certain look to a child that's born with fetal alcohol syndrome. But they're the, the cognitive difficulties that are really the most problematic, I would say. I mean, there's, you know, mental retardation is a piece of this. Uh, it impacts the frontal lobe, you know, that sort of last piece to develop that we, we know of from the brain. And executive function is impaired then, so, you know, less ability to sort of control impulses, less ability to sort of, you know, make judgments and decisions and interpretations of things, those sort of finer cognitive abilities that uh, are, are really important important to functioning well as an adult. Right. And, and, and I, I don't, as far as I know, I don't think there's any argument about the scientific evidence, I mean, about the science of it. The science is pretty, uh, uh, they, they, they refer to the syndrome, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. I mean, it, it's of different characteristics, different things that they identify. But I think most folks would agree that you have to be very, very careful around alcohol when you're pregnant. And again, I think the the takeaway from that is that, you know, if you can avoid alcohol, if you can not drink while you're pregnant or planning on getting pregnant, that's probably the best thing. Yeah. Do you agree? Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. do, do you want to play that game of, uh, say, Russian roulette with, with your, your child? Right, right. Yeah. I don't think they do. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, and I know in a previous show I talked about this, in the library there was two new books, and... Um, I, I talked about it. I mean, one was very much so uh, a, a woman. Uh, she was an editor. Uh, I think she worked as a professor in Montreal, and then she was an editor in a magazine. And, and she actually got sober and talked about her success in 12-step programs. But there was another book, and she sort of uh, also struggled with alcohol. Um, but she felt that AA was not appropriate for her or, or for women in general and thought it was AA was a sort of hostile environment to it. And so I think both of those books, I mean, you can read them and, and, and find something to it. But it made me think about, you know, many, oh, 20-some years ago, uh, I remember when we first started treating more and more women for alcoholism. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we had uh, women's uh, liberation movements. And one of the things that they talked about for some of the women was this sense of empowerment, that they, you had to give them a sense of empowerment um, and yet AA, in their first step, talk about people being powerless. And so there was a movement for a little while there, and I imagine it's still out there, to sort of avoid recommending the first step to women, especially women who have been victims, who have struggled with this concept of powerlessness. And that, that was a very dangerous concept. And uh, all, all I can say is that, you know, from, from what I know, is that many women are in AA and are very successful. And uh, it used to be that they were a little bit, you know, maybe 20%. And uh, if the indication of how many men and women on the unit, when I used to work 30 years ago, there would maybe be three women and 17 men. Uh, but the last couple of years that I was working, uh, I would say women were at least 50% maybe 40 yeah, percent. Right. Mean, and uh, we, we see this a lot of, uh, um, say, public health statistics, too, that uh, as uh, women have gained equality, they've also not been stigmatized about smoking or about drinking, and they're allowed to sort of, in, say, allowed. It's acceptable that they engage in the same sort of behaviors that men have been engaging in for a long time. And with cigarette smoking, what you could see was that you know, 30 years after women began smoking, then they began to have similar rates of cancers, emphysema, that men had had. And I think now with women as well, right, we're seeing that uh, these sorts of illnesses, like, uh, like fatty liver, cirrhosis, hepatitis, that were associated with male drinkers, we're now seeing those in women as well at, at, at comparable rates. But one of the sort of uh, unfairnesses of, of nature is that women are more susceptible, 
right? So drinking uh, lower amounts and drinking for a shorter period of time, they're still prone for the same level of illness that men who are drinking more and longer will have, such as the types of dementias that happen or liver diseases that happen or other cardiovascular effects. Um, so another reason is to be more, more careful about this with, uh, with women. Right, and, and, uh, and the thing with the powerlessness is that for, from the concept of alcoholics in recovery and trying to counsel them with this idea is that it has to be absolute. You can't drink. And so powerless is a sort of pretty straightforward word. I mean, it means you have no power over it. And, and you know, many alcoholics, believe me, want to argue that. I mean, uh, they feel that most of the time they have control over it. They, you know, they limit themselves. They don't get in trouble. But, uh, and the trouble that they do have is fairly periodic. You know, it happens off and on. So, uh, but the thing that you'll see with alcoholics is that they find that they can't leave it alone. They can't limit how much they take. They can't always predict how it's going to turn out. Uh, and it does cause some problems in their life. And so I think at some level, at the same time that women want to take their rightful place among men, I think uh, they want to say that they have as much right, I guess they have as much right to be an alcoholic but I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, I, you know what I mean? I don't mean that like, yeah. no, that sounds like a smart well, no, we're remark. We're starting to have sexist here, right? Yeah, but I don't mean really that. I'm just saying that, you know, I, I want to appreciate empowerment, but on the same level, I mean, one of the things that happens when you admit powerlessness is, is that you sort of acknowledge that you can't drink. I mean, it, it's really, uh, and most alcoholics, for, you know, the ones who continue to drink for the rest of their lives, uh, we'll constantly be negotiating, you know, well, I'll drink beer and not whiskey, I'll drink in the morning, but not in the afternoon. I mean, you know, it's this constant sort of, um, you know, mention, I mentioned, you know, uh, people who control, who like have limit their drinks to a day or only one after work or whatever rules they set up. And then the rest of their life, they're trying to follow these arbitrary rules. And I'm, it's, I'm sorry to say that most alcoholics, as their behaviors get worse, their rules change. Yeah, uh, but then too, the person who's able to have one drink every day with, with dinner or whatever when they come to work, we hardly suggest they're an alcoholic. Right. They're, they're not out of control. They seem to have a power over yeah. that. And, and, and too, we've had a number of, we've had guests this season, and, and we've talked about this too, that the idea of you have a responsibility, responsibility around your mental health. You have, you have responsibilities, you have choices to make around your addictions. And so it would seem to say that, okay, I'm powerless against alcohol or I'm powerless against drugs. is a real contradiction to us saying that. But I think, uh, you know, when I think about that, I, I never really took the idea of being powerless over alcohol, that first, you know, the first step in AA, to really mean that you were helpless. I think the two very different things. I almost think about it as a, and I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not sure how to pronounce this word, but that were Buddhist cones, or they're sort of like riddles or, or, or statements like, you know, what's the sound of one hand clapping? You might think that there is an immediate answer to that, but that immediate answer is not the answer. There's a, there's a depth to it. It needs to be reflected on and wrestled with and, and, and contemplated and turned inside out. And I think it's quite you know, common with a lot of things that we can waste a lot of time and a lot of energy attempting something that is not within our grasp or attempting something that is just, you know, fruitless, absolutely futile to do. And I think that when people struggle with addiction and with alcoholism in particular, that what this step says is you need to really stop it. You know, just, just give this is the way it is, accept it, and now do some work. Now yeah. take some responsibility. And, and I think that people are smart enough to know that if they admit that they're an alcoholic, then they shouldn't drink. And, and I mean, quite frankly, I mean, and so a lot of people will, will sort of say, well, I don't, I don't want to say that I'm an alcoholic. And, you, and you'll sometimes, uh, I remember, you know, on the unit, um, talk to a patient and say, you know, I said it for the first time last night. Or, yeah. you know, we used to have these community meetings and people would go around the room and yeah. identify themselves. And, we used to have people say, well, let's not have them identified by their disease and let's have them say something good about it. I, I worked yeah, to a woman yeah. named Alice. And, and so yeah. we, we'd say, okay, now here's what you have to do. You have to introduce yourself and say something good about yourself. You know? yeah. and, and so invariably we get people say, oh, hi, I'm Billy, I'm an alcoholic and I'm good at this. Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it's, it was 
so ingrained in the culture that's right. uh, and the culture of AA and, and the, you know maybe that's where some people take offense or, or feel uncomfortable is yes, they don't feel like they fit in that culture and they don't and, and I and I understand that I mean it, it's sort of but it was sort of funny when Alice Alice would be like no no I don't you, know, you don't have to say yeah. that you know we, we know why you're here yeah. you know. uh, because for a lot of old time treatment centers I mean old, you know, counselors that was a break, real breakthrough was yeah. to get them to you know admit that they're an alcoholic right. because often uh, it's something they've been uh, quote in denial of yeah. you know uh, so I you know alcohol awareness month and that's what this month is is not trying to get everybody to acknowledge that they're an alcoholic I think the idea is that to get everybody to acknowledge that it's a drug mm -hmm. and that it's a drug that's legal in our society but it's a drug that is really harmful and it causes a lot of problems um, and that th the sort of reluctance or resistance sometimes to get help to deal with it I mean it's something that you and I've talked about it it's sort of like do you like the way your life is going yeah. you know uh, is there something you're doing in your life that you wish you weren't doing yeah. and is there something in your life that you need help with yeah. and I, I you know what I mean I, and I think that's like really valid questions I mean I think it's like a, um, you know and if so you know Talk to somebody, you know, get help. And, don't, yeah. you know, and don't there are hindrances to this, go too, ahead. because it, 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 it's everywhere. I, I, you can't get gas. You can't go to the grocery store. Everybody's drinking. Everybody's enjoying it, right? Nobody's having these kinds of troubles. And so there's this, this, this attitude socially that's really kind of discouraging. This, it really sort of encourages that this is fun. This is the right way to be and not to look at it as, as potentially harmful. Right. You know, cigarette smoking, you don't see that. Uh, you know, with, with you know, cocaine, with drug use now, you know, opiates, you're seeing people saying, yeah, you know, it, it might be fun, but it's not healthy. And, and there really needs to, I, I think we've got such a, a just a, a, the wrong attitude socially around intoxicants in, in, in general. Yeah. I, I remember working with a, a, a doctor psychiatrist when I first started, and, and she talked about, you know, if AA didn't exist, we would try to invent something like it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting in a way. AA sort of says somewhere in their traditions, you know, it's attraction, not promotion. You know, they, they, they were hoping that they would attract people to it. You know, and they've got like two million members or so. But now we've gotten to a point where people get sent to AA and they resent it. And it really was never meant to be a place where you were forced to go. And I think in some ways, I appreciate it. Like if you get a DWI or something and they tell you, well, you have to go to meetings or something. Um, the idea is that let's expose them to it. Uh, some people will get sober. Uh, so at least they'll know where it is and they'll know what it's about. And, and I guess it does work for some. But boy, I tell you, it's really. I think it's. I think it's lost some of its sense of uh, when people are made to go, when they're forced to go. I think on some level, I mean, it's it sort of you. You go there, and they had this uh, wonderful thing in AA. They used to say. Um, if you identify with somebody, you know, you identify with them um, and you're looking for how you're the same. If you compare yourself with somebody, you're looking for how you're different. And I think what happens with people who are forced to go to meetings, they spend the whole meeting looking around comparing themselves. Well, I haven't done that. Well, I haven't done this or I'm not that bad. And they come out of the meetings feeling like, well, I don't belong here. And it's not uncommon. When I worked in a hospital, I would talk to somebody, and they're on their second or third or fourth hospitalization for alcoholism, and I'd mention AA, and they go, no, I tried that. I, I went there once, and it didn't work. And I think they probably went at the wrong time. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it's yeah, sort of yeah. like they went, they went, and, and instead of hearing uh, recovery, instead of listening for how they might be the same as the other people in the room, they actually went in the room and figured out why they're not the same as the mm -hmm, people in mm -hmm. the room and decided that AA was not for them. Yeah, so. yeah. And I think it was the idea that, uh, you know, of course, there are plenty of sinners in church, for example, but I know with uh, and seeing this more from the, the, the opiate addiction perspective that uh, people who go to these, who are attracted to the meetings, when then probation and parole, you know, mandates that uh, their charges go to an NA meeting, for example, it sets up a different dynamic because then the folks, 
who I've worked with have told me they're there for their recovery, they, they want the fellowship, they want the support, and then in come these folks who are forced to go there, and they tend to really sort of be there for, for making drug deals, uh, acquiring their next fix, and then it really makes it uh, a counterproductive or you know, diluted uh, or negative experience for the folks who are there by attraction as opposed to being mandated. So I, I, would have, I can imagine it's not much different with AA if you find people who don't want to be there. Yeah, and the problem with, in some ways is it's, it's sort of like that, what's newsworthy? Uh, you know, dog bites man is not newsworthy. Man bites dog is newsworthy. And so I remember there was this uh, expose about some meeting in Manhattan that had some sort of inappropriate behaviors. And so they, it was an article in Time magazine about this AA meeting that had this thing. And yet I bet there's a thousand meetings on Manhattan or, you know, pick a number, a hundred meetings on Manhattan every hour, every day or something. Yeah. And it goes perfectly fine. But that's not newsworthy. That's not, yeah. you know what I mean? That is not, uh, that's not what you're going to write about. What you're going to, and I know recently I was reading, I think it was Bennington, it was that article in the Rolling Stone, or maybe it was one of these other articles oh. where they said people go to meetings and they do drugs there. Yeah. Well, now, you would hear that, like when in a hospital, I would hear somebody say, you know, well, I go to AA and all the folks that go to AA drink. Well, I don't think that's true. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. But, they, you know, the way they would say it is as if it, the, everybody would show up and for an hour they would be sober and then they, everybody would get drunk. And yet, yeah. I know that's not true. I mean, I yeah. have colleagues and friends and peers yeah. and people who I knew who don't drink who go to AA and they, they I mean, it's just not true. Yeah. Well, here's it's one of the controversies too, right, is that especially hear this too with uh, that all these these bad news stories like you know Rolling Stones New York Times that uh, they're picking out the few people who misuse or who do not do well and they're completely ignoring how many people are, are, are helped or even saved by by this program and but given the, uh, the whole sort of the basis for AA and the idea of anonymity it's it's really discouraged people from coming forward and say, hey, you know what, I'm an AA, I'm an AA. You know, the million of us are the face of AA and it works because, well, that's just not the basis for it. So it's, it's a bit of a struggle there. Yeah, it is. And, and as you know, we had uh, people from the recovery centers on and they, they, they actually want to put a face on it. They actually say, you know, these are people in the community and they are sober and people do put down a drink and they do develop better quality of lives. And so, and that does sort of run, you know, uh, the, the anonymous part of AA is that like they don't want people to be identified as Mr. AA. They don't want uh, anyone to be the representative of AA because they're always afraid that that person, if they take on the persona of Mr. AA, they can harm the organization. And, and also, the, from the very beginning, they, they really wanted to make sure that everybody in AA was equal. And that's why, uh, like, some people get nervous about why they make them say they're alcoholics. And, and they say, well, is that like shame, you know? And I, I, I don't think it's shame as much as it's like your ticket for a mission. Uh, David Brooks, I don't know if you know him, an op-ed writer for the New York Times, he wrote this wonderful article about suffering. And he said that suffering adds depth to people, and it adds depth to their character. And a guy named Ernie Kurtz, who wrote the history of AA, uh, called it, he called it not God. He said that was the premise, is that everybody has to acknowledge that they're not God. Um, he said the common bond in AA is suffering. And I think that that was the idea behind the, hi, I'm Bill, and I'm Joe, and I'm Mary, was that it, it isn't your stature in life, it wasn't your education, it wasn't what neighborhood you lived in, what ethnic group you belonged to. It was this idea that you were, like everyone else, you had suffered. And so you would say your first name, and then you would say, and I'm an alcoholic. And that meant that you had the ticket for admission. You know what I mean? It's it sort of, so I think, you know, one of the dangers sometimes in, in uh, talking about history is that you use what you know today to judge what people did back then. And I think, you know, uh, now we talk about shame-based and empowerment and disempowerment. But, you know, when AA started, what they were looking for was to sort of find a place where 
everybody was equal. Everybody admitted that they were defeated by booze and that they needed each other to get better. They needed spirituality. They needed help. Uh, and, and, and I think, you know, I think on some level, and I don't, AA doesn't need me to defend it, I mean, by any means. But I, I, I think in some level that it's a, um, it, it, has, it has the both of both worlds. It has very good endorsement by people who work in the field who have no hesitation at all of telling people to go to AA. Uh, but it also has uh, uh, people who know of individual things that are not good about it. And it frightens people away from AA. So... Yeah. I, I guess it's a little bit of both. Yeah, but that's the piece that I mean. Research shows that the, the fact that getting together with with the, with people, a community, or a fellowship, if you will, of people who encourage being sober, that that's a departure for people who are, are alcoholic. And I mean, the, the suffering we know this from you know, boot camp, medical school, you know, war experiences. When you go through an incredibly difficult experience together, and you share a bond that people outside that group don't share. That that's, that that's quite a cohesive uh, piece of this, that, that that draws you together and you feel that identity with each other. So I'm sure that's a very strong you know, piece of this as well because we see it in so many other areas as also. Right. And, and to go back to what we said at the beginning, it, and my, my hope anyway is that alcohol awareness makes people aware that alcohol is a drug and that it's a dangerous drug. And uh, ask any police department, uh, you know, go ask any emergency room nurse, uh, ask them what's the number one drug that they see as a problem. And, you know, we talk about opiates and cocaine and everything, yeah. but alcohol is the one that consistently shows up, uh, you know, when people dying from it, emergency rooms, uh, DWIs, fatal accidents, domestic violence, uh, fights, assault. All of them have alcohol. I mean, I don't know the percentage, but it's fairly high. Yeah. Uh, alcohol is there. So, I mean, we have this dilemma in our society where it's a legal drug. Uh, it's part of our culture. It's in our religious services. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it, and, and it, it's advertised relentlessly on TV. Um, the, the good times that you can have on booze, it's part of your college experience, it's all that stuff. But people should never forget that ultimately it's a drug, and it's a drug that can cause an awful lot of harm. I mean, very, very destructive. And if you're in trouble with booze, you know, try and stop. The, the trick is that people could stop early enough without going to AA, without going to treatment, without going to detox. But it's still, they're still having fun with it. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. it, it, if you could only stop when you're still able to stop, this would be less of a problem. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't work that way. Yeah, and I mean, we too see, see the statistics, it's like emergency room visits and, and, and harms, really kind of going back and forth. And I think that when you look at the other drugs, whether it's the opiates, it's marijuana, it's alcohol, they do share this commonality of, of being unhealthy causing a great sort of morbidity and mortality, which means sort of, you know, poor quality of life and, and death. And uh, it's uh, the commonness of alcohol, the ever-present nature of it, does not take away the danger of it. Yeah. Uh, so we're coming to a close. It's another half hour has gone by. They go by yeah. quick. Yeah. Uh, we're actually coming to the end of this year of, of our shows. We have a, right. about a month more to go. Right, so about May 19th will be the last May one. 19th. May 19th. And uh, so if you have any comments or suggestions or questions, uh, please send it in to us. Yeah. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's my camera. This one is his. And this is our... our Ha, 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 ha.